and that's the magic. So once you have them generate that rationale, validate it, acknowledge it, agree with it, right? Let them know, hey, I'm behind you on that. So let me ask you a question. Soften everything. We didn't get to soften first, but we should. On a scale of 0 to 10, how much might you want to do that? And they're going to give you a number. I don't care if it's a 10. I've taken it to 12. Okay? I don't care if it's a 1. The next question, complete. It threw everybody. Everybody I asked, why did you read? Why didn't you read? Why didn't you rate, why didn't you rate it less? And they go, what? Because they're expected to have to fight in the other way, right? And now also they have to change how they think. Also, well, I didn't rate it less because I really want that. <laughs> right? And all of a sudden, the moment they start coming up with a defense, you engage reactants towards the behavior you want. And they will fight to defend it. And you ask a simple question. Great. So what's the next step, if any, that we need to take? <laughs> and they'll tell you. Don't believe me. <laughs> Go out and use it. Let me tell you how pervasive. I have it on video. It's not a great quality, but it, I've actually used this process on people in pain and taken their pain away. I've used it on tinnitus. Guy had ringing in his ears. Jeff, you were there for that. Were you at the conversational hypnosis master class? Where I took the guy's tinnitus away? I don't remember that. No. Okay. I'll, I'll see if I can find that clip. I'll put it on video. You only see me because he's off camera. But like two or three of the guys had ringing in their ears. And I said, really? On a scale of zero to ten, how, how bad is it? He goes, eight? I go, really? And I went, I, I used pain control to go the opposite direction. Because you want to make it less, right? So why didn't you rate that more? Well, because it's not. It's not. Oh, okay. So how is it now? He goes, six. Oh, really? Well, why didn't you rate it more? Well, because it's less. Oh. Well, what is it now? Four. <laughs> and you can see him getting from the... <laughs> right? And I literally, we literally got it to zero. I said, well, we'll try to bring it back. He goes, I don't want it back! Right? The nervous system really, I mean, when you really get into the see the matrix, the nervous system doesn't really care what kinds of information it processes. The human nervous system, along with being one of the most powerful goal-achieving mechanisms on the planet, is also the biggest reality interpretation mechanism ever. Anything we communicate at the most primal fundamental level is the equivalent of electromagnetic impulses, ones and zeros. Everything else is interpretation. And once you understand the system and the filters that guide it, you can make the system express any data in any way. Yes. I'm very interesting here because I was taught that your success rate in his may have not expression directly, directly relates to the client's determination to change or commitment to change. What you're saying is they don't have to have determination to change because you can, you know, kind of manipulate your way. You can engineer that. Yeah, okay, that's very interesting for me. What if somebody says, not, I should, I should lose weight. Mm -hmm. I've been on a million dollars. I should. What is your, how would you reverse that on that? So why? Why should you lose weight? Because the bottom line is, is everybody and their brothers are telling them why they should lose weight. And you know what? You don't have to lose weight if you don't want to lose weight. If you like your life, if you like the way you are, screw those other people. It's your life. It's your choice. But I'm curious. If you were to, why might you? Screw them. Why might you want to lose weight? What's the first thing that pops in your head? Answer the question. Me? Oh. Yeah, I'm out of trance. To 
travel or lose weight to help losing weight to help you travel more? Oh, I see. Okay. So, you know what? I've, I've, I've been that guy. I used to be 70 pounds heavier, and I know what it's like to be sandwiched between two very large people and being large yourself. So let me ask you a question on a scale of 0 to 10. How much might you want to drop those pounds so you can travel? Uh, yeah. 10? Awesome. Why didn't you read that less? What just happened with the desire? Right? The moment we have to change our perspective and defend our reasoning, which is what we do anyway. Everybody who comes in, you know, the minute you try to rationalize, God, ladies, you know this, anytime a guy tries to convince you to go out on a date with him, they give you the slide rule, the spreadsheets, and they tell you all the reasons why they sh you should go out with them. Right? Poor shit. Make, make, you, make you women feel happy and fun? You want a problem. Yes? So it doesn't really matter what they're rating it at. You're, you're basically just fighting their, their nope. statement. Right. No, nope. the only caveat you have to watch out for um, is sometimes if, if, if the reason they give you, there's, you might have to chunk down to something within their rationale that you can agree with, right? And it, when, you're, when you're doing rapport skills, one of the things you always want to do is you never want to necessarily disagree with people, but you want, if, if there's something they're saying that you don't always agree with, you want to chunk down to something within the words that come out of their mouth or their rationale that you can agree with. Does that make sense? Like mm -hmm. um, some people, like it's very polarization, gun control, right? Maybe you're dealing with somebody who thinks Obama should be shot because he's against guns, right? Right? And, and maybe, maybe you know, two very polarized issues right there, right? Obama and guns. Period. End of story, right? But maybe you're having an argument about gun control, and maybe you agree. Maybe you you don't agree with that. You say, you know what? I agree that something should be done about the gun situation in this country. Did I say I agree with gun control? No. But I did agree with the fact that there, there was something in what that person said that I can agree with. I've removed that barrier. Just like when I had Brian up here. I found something within Brian that I could connect with, that I could agree with, that I could become one with. And when I had that, I had leverage over his center of gravity. Same thing with rapport skills. When you're dealing with rapport, we, we don't always have to agree, but we have to find something within what comes out of their mouth that we can agree with. The person has to really feel like you're on their team and that you support them, that you get them. Does that make sense? I think, I think this is probably a better process. I mean, I, want, I would love to handle you guys with all kinds of hypnotic language, but I think this process for a lot of you will be very, very useful because I've used this to close sales. Matter of fact, this is primarily the way that I convert prospects into clients. When I do my coaching, you know, my, my initial consultation, I'll sit down and talk with them for 30 minutes about why their life sucks, right? And then I'll ask them why they, you know, how much they want to change and why. And then I'll, I'll start to ask them a very simple question. I say, look, this is your choice. Why might you want to do this? Or how much do you want to do this? And they'll say, 10. And I'll say, really? Great. So why, why didn't you rate that last? And they're looking like, idiot. And then they start, and you can see that, that defensiveness go up, which means they've bought into the process. They've engaged, right? And once you, once you tap into people's own reasons for doing, whether you agree with it or not, whether you think it's just a tiny, nitpicky, wishy-washy issue, it's not about you. It's about them. That's their reason for change. And that's the most powerful reason on the planet for them. And as long as you keep them connected to it, using their own words. When I was giving you that, when I was running you through this formula, how many times <clears throat> when I repeated back to you your reason did I use their own words? Right? Everything stacks. Right? The most powerful words you can use on a human being are the ones coming out of their mouth. And if you just understand that principle, you will be irresistibly hypnotic anywhere you go. You don't need to have complex language patterns. You just got to feel a certain way and pay attention. Pay attention to the people in front of you. Listen to the words. Give them their words back. Link their words 
to the things you want them to do in a way that they get it. That they understand they're getting what they want. You will induce profound trance states and profound compliance. It can't not happen. All righty. Anybody got something? Yes, sir. You're waving your glasses at me. Yes. I went into trance for a minute. Okay, so, um, real quick, questions on, I'm going I'm to actually write that, those steps on the board for you so you can, in my system this is called the Autonomizer Formula. It's based on that book Instant Influence by Michael Panelon. Michael goes into much greater detail on the autonomy aspects of things than I do here. There's a whole list of questions and ways to ask questions that, and it's actually useful, it's, it's a useful uh, exercise because certain ways that we ask questions, we think are giving person their autonomy, but actually create a, a feeling of being disempowered or being manipulated. So that's useful. Pantalon, P-A-N-T-A-L-O-N-E, or Pantalon. So, real quick recap, what we've covered today. We started with the critical path of influence, right? State control. Rapport. Language. Within the language pattern component, I gave you what was commonly referred to as the autonomizer formula and the echo technique. We covered, uh, we talked a little bit about state management. We didn't go too deep into it, although everything you've been doing through here has been managing people's states, hasn't it? Right? Process. And then ultimately, we've been referring back to criteria and values the whole time. Language patterns that we covered were cause and effect. Complex equivalents. We gave you, we told you that X causes Y. X equals Y. X is always a pace. Y is always a lead. Pace is anything that is true that we can verify. Lead is anything we want them to do. Right? Shit, it seems almost organized. Right? Does it matter how many pacing statements you have before you go to Y? No. There's a, there's a common formula in, in uh, NLP and some Ericksonian uh, systems called stacking realities or the 54321 method. And, and that method is basically you have paces and leads. And they're, the way they train you, it's very hard to track, which is why I, I teach it in my conversational hypnosis trainings. Uh, I teach a little bit differently than here, but basically you start with five paces and one lead, and you would go to four paces and two leads, three paces, three leads, two paces, four leads, one pace, five leads, and then you just lead, lead, and lead. Okay. So you could literally, I'll give, I'll give you the first couple, so I pick five things in the room. Right? Sitting here in this room, feeling the environment, hearing the sounds of my voice, and understanding my words, paying attention to them, causes you to begin to rapidly internalize this information. And as you rapidly internalize this information, and you begin to understand how it relates directly to you, even as you relax more in the chair, you can begin to let this information go in. Right? Now, I, sneak, I snuck some stuff in there. I switched from something that is physically paceable to something that is cognitively paceable. Right? And then what I did, was I followed a, set, a basic formula, but I turned them, I went from external reality to internal reality. Started talking about realizing, feeling, understanding, right? 
So I shifted you from external to internal. Right? And then, and I again, this, this is very hard to consciously track, right? But this would be a good writing exercise, right? What I do with my students a lot of times is I'll literally have them take, make a list of 15 paces in their environment, and then 15 leads. And I'll just have them randomly string paces and leads together just to get used to linking things, right? And it creates it creates profound trance effects. I mean, you can't you can't fight it because the moment you, your your brain consciously, regardless of what you consciously want, the moment your brain picks up something that's sensorially true, it clicks off a reality button. And as you hit five, four, three, two, one, it's just it just it just goes along for the ride. It doesn't want to parse it, right? You can get even sneakier. This is where we get. This is kind of where it gets fun. It's kind of what I did to you guys. If I start with five paces in one lead, and I give you that lead, and you accept it, you act upon it, it's now something that's true, which means you can pace it. Remember, anything a pace, anything that is sensorily or cognitively verifiable is true. So the minute I say, and as you realize how powerful this information is. The moment you realize it, it's not true. Which means, as you realize it's true, it just goes deeper. And as you realize it's going deeper, and you notice the effect it's having, you can try to fight it and realize it's already too late. Right? It's like, oh shit. <laughs> right? This is called cyclical pacing and leading. The moment a person accepts a lead, it becomes true in your world. Which means you can pace it. Yes. So you would use like um, body movement, for example, lift a finger. You could. Or they are <sighs> anything. Or anything. Any of that at that moment. Yeah. It's the principle I want you to get. The form can take. It can be anything you want. Right. Any pace can be linked to any Y. And the moment it's accepted and acted upon, it's true. Which means you can use it as the next pace. Yes, sir. Is it better or is it different in every circumstance or worse to when you turn your uh, your lead into a pace, like you did the very next time you started with it, mm -hmm. do you kind of digest it or do you speed along so they don't have time? Oh, I'm just going to flow. And again, you don't have to you don't have to go at light speed. In fact, many times you, you can be more compelling by putting a rhythm, by putting a spacing into your words. Um, my, my choice is to, always, is to always use my normal cadence, but what you'll notice is that as I speak, I tend to pace back and forth. And that pace tends to have a rhythm to it. So I'm always doing things on multiple levels, right? But the whole idea is, if, you, if the fastest way to get nowhere with this information is to try to do everything at once. Go deep with a couple of things and become unstoppable at it. Make your strengths unstoppable. Come back and add something new. Because you'll never stop learning. There will always be another level that you can take it to. But you want to be effective today. The fastest way to do that is to take some advice from Bruce Lee. Start with your strengths and make them unstoppable. Do what you're good at. Do what you enjoy. And then add Make sense? Um, so, we said cause and effect is x, e, x causes y. Complex equivalence is what? X equals y. Again, any x can cause any y. Right? Love is freedom. Money is power. Sex is fun. That class is at the end of it. Um, Okay, uh, let's see what else. We've covered, let's cover this, this group a little bit deeper and review the autonomizer for you guys real quick. Autonomizer, first thing, restore autonomy, right? Second step. Why might you want to X? X being whatever comes out of their mouth. 
right? Remember, we're always validating their reasons, agreeing with it, and restoring their sense of personal autonomy. If we don't do that, they're going to feel like, they're, like you're trying to manipulate them. They're going to react, be reacting in the wrong direction. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Once they give us a reason, we use their exact words as we validate what came out of their mouth. And then we ask them to rate it on a scale of 0 to 10. How much might you want to do that? So, so it's scale. How much might you want to do that? Whatever words come out of their mouth, repeat them back verbatim and agree with it. And then ask them a question. Why didn't you rate it less? And you will see them do the double take. Like you just slapped them with a wet fish or something. Right? And they'll like, why didn't I rate it less? I said, yeah, why didn't you rate that less? And be congruent with this. Be sincere. Right? You don't, think, don't think of it like you're playing a trick on somebody. Your job is to get change. Period. That's why they came to you. If they've, if they've, if they've given you permission to influence them, Use whatever it takes. That's your job. Change the reality. But why didn't you rate that less? Whatever it is, that's fine. If you need to go, if you want to amplify a little more, you can go back and revisit the process. I don't usually. Unless I see like maybe something else that might boost that that desire and you know, along the same lines. And then he has a simple question. Great. So this is what we want to do. What's the next step, if any, that we need to take? And you let them come up with the step. Yes? Didn't you rate it again right now? You could. Well, actually, what I do, uh, for these guys, I was doing it as a demo, right? Because I wanted them to, to, to see things. So what I do here is, is um, once they give me the reason, and I validate it, right? I ask them, on a scale of 0 to 10, how much might you want to do that? I always use that might. That might is magic in this context. In NLP, and a lot of things, we're taught never to use words like might. Or why. Especially in NLP, why is like the kiss of death. In this particular context, why is strategically and tactically useful? Because it generates a rationale. And once a person generates a rationale, they will fight tooth and nail to protect it. And that's what we want. We just want to make sure they're fighting in the right direction. If you're, let's say you want to get a kid to clean the toilet, because you're hurt, mm -hmm. room, why might you not want to do this? You're going to because I want to go out and play. I mean, how are you going to get up? Okay. Well, you guys know, well, obviously you know that before we need to, you know, you can go out and play, we need to get room clean, right? So why might you want to clean your room? You know, why might it be a good idea? I like that sometimes. Just why might it be a good idea to get this thing handled? Right? Then it's not even a solid there, it's an idea, right? Yes. When you ask uh, why might you rate it less, if they I wouldn't say why might you rate it less, I said why didn't you rate it why less. Why didn't you rate it less? Very important. Okay. Uh, might they think that you are challenging them? The, you are challenging them. Yes, but challenging them just by saying you're still doing this, therefore why are you rating it so high? No, I didn't ask why you're rating it so high. I know, I know you're not asking that. I haven't had that happen. Yeah. No, I haven't. In fact, they're anticipating that, and when they get the opposite, it's a confusion induction because they're expecting it. They're expecting it to come. To, to, I don't think you understand. Uh, it's for example, um, I'm I'm on this weight. Mm -hmm. uh, do you? I do. Uh, okay. Uh, you might ask, well, um, why do I want to lose weight? No, I why said, why, why might you want to lose weight? Because the first thing I'm going to do is give you back your autonomy. Yes. Because if I say, why might you want to lose weight, now you have to defend yourself. Right? I say, look, whether you want to lose weight or not, I'm going to support it. 
You know, I know sometimes people tell us we need to lose weight and we buy into that and we, we're here because other people are telling us we need weight. And if that's and if that's if that's your situation, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pass judgment on it. I'm here to support you. So you know. And then I'm gonna say, but just for the sake of the conversation we're having, if you were to want to lose weight, why might you want to do it for your reasons? Well, they wouldn't be in your chair if they didn't want some change on some level, right? Uh, I'm talking about personal. <coughs> okay. All right. You might want them to change, mm -hmm. uh, but they're not. Mm -hmm. And when you ask, uh, and they make their desire to change as, as 10, mm -hmm. and you say, well, why didn't you make it less? Because you were, and then I think, because you are still doing what you're doing. And, uh, because you're still doing what you're doing. I haven't had that happen. No, no, never had that. Yes. Uh, we only got like about half an hour left. And, uh, okay. Since you said that the uh, uh, criteria of values is kind of like the persuasion bullseye, I, I, I don't know what you still want to hold, but I kind of that. Yeah. Okay. So what's important about learning criteria of values for you? Uh, I don't know that much about it. And, you know the, the fact that uh, you, know, you said it's important. You don't know that much about it, and you said it was important. Okay. And if you were to know about criteria and values because I said it was important, what might that do for you? Deeper understanding of it, make it more effective. More effective. What's that look like? Better outcomes, quicker results. Better outcomes and quicker results. So if I were to teach you about criteria and values, you could get better outcomes and was it quicker outcomes or better outcomes? Um, better outcomes and quicker results. Better outcomes and quicker results, so you could be more effective. And that would really inspire you, wouldn't it? You just learned it. <laughs> <laughs> How'd it feel? Like, like we were on a track. Like, Look at him! <laughs> Look at him! <laughs> Felt completely natural, didn't it? Yep. It's very different being on the outside of that experience than, than actually watching it or being in it. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, quick question back to the compromiser. Mm -hmm. What's the next step, if any, that we need to take to take this to further? They give you They'll come up with something, and that's where you that's where you take them next. And do you re them to go through the whole process? Really depends on if you're meeting resistance or not, okay. right? You know, the bottom line is, is it, depending on your context, right? What you don't want to do though is you want to, you want to be very you don't want to like jump on it. Like the minute you ask, like, so what's the next step, if any, that, that we need to take to take this to the next level? They tell you, and you go, okay, let's do this. Right? You just be very matter of fact. Okay, well, let's get you on the schedule. You know, how soon do you want to start? That's usually where I go next. The minute they say, well, I, I guess we need to set up a session, I go, well, usually what I'll, when, I, when I do my close, I'll just, I won't even ask if they want the session. I'll say, well, look, how, do you want, how fast do you want to get started? How soon do you want to get started? Right? And, you know, yeah. And again, it's, you know, depending on, on what your pricing is and, and what the problem is and what their, their value of themselves is, they'll jump on it. But usually, I have, I have a pretty high closing rate. But getting back to criteria and values, that takes it to a whole other level. Because when you're doing the autonomizer, you're coming, you're generating a rationale that they, you know, for why they might want to do it. That it's indirectly connected to the criteria and <laughs> values. But still, it's powerful because it's their words and it's their rationale, and they're defending it. Right? They're literally resisting themselves into complying. Right? With criteria, <laughs> with criteria and values, the more you, you connect them to their to that those emotional building blocks of their identity, the more they associate their identity with what you're giving them. So, it, it, did you feel emotions when I was starting? To, when I was giving you, right? It, it wasn't. It wasn't this cold. It was. It was exactly what he wanted to hear. There was no. You know, I didn't have to give him a features and benefits statement. Worst way to sell anything is features and benefits. Yes, David. Mm -hmm. 
No, no. I, I would I would want to clarify some things about about towards and away from meta programs. You guys know what a meta program is? If you don't raise your hands, because I need to know. Okay, a meta program is a is a is a filter that is cross contextual. Like some people, if I were to ask you to to tell me about like uh, if I went to this gentleman here and asked him to tell me about these three markers. Uh, one's black, two green. One black, two green. Different sameness. Sameness, right? That's a meta program for how he, when he looks at data, he looks at information. First he looks at what's different, then he looks at what's the same. Take the, take the content out and look at the overall process. Or if I went up to her, she might tell me something complete. She might start with, you know. They're all about seven inches. They're all about seven, sameness. Right? Right. There's basically four, so that's one meta program. We, we cover those in our NLP trainings. But if you understand meta programs, then you automatically know how to present information to somebody that they're most naturally geared towards processing it. Right? Very, very powerful in selling and, and persuasion uh, aspects. Getting back to criteria and values, but getting back to back to David real quick. When we start talking about towards and away from, remember you have a reptile brain. <laughs> Yeah, you have three brains. You have your reptile brain, aka your paleocortex, your limbic system or your mammalian brain, and you have the neocortex. Your mammalian brain works on primal drives. It is the most powerful, oldest, and in my case, in our case, the one we want to talk to the most. That that reptilian brain will generate emotions. Those emotions generate behaviors and complex behaviors specifically. And then your neocortex, that newer level of your brain, will come up with a story to justify it that may have nothing to do with the real reason you're doing it. Okay? In this particular, in the autonomizer, you're actually working with the neocortex by attacking that rationale and causing them to psychologically lock in and defend it. In criteria and values, you're going to the limbic and the reptilian levels of the brain and engendering it towards or away from response. But all people have a, a prejudice towards away from. All people, all human beings, whether you have a meta program that's towards or a meta program that's away from, we all default to away from. Okay, it's, it's called the Zagarnik effect. We will fight harder to keep the dollar in our pocket than we will work to get a new dollar. Zagarnik effect. Okay? We're all hardwired this way. It's adaptive, it's how we evolved and how we survived as a species. Pain has to be more compelling. Otherwise, we die fast. Okay? So while a lot of us who are more evolved like to think that we're towards people, and we may be in certain contexts, at the end of the day, we will experience more pain from losing the dollar in our pocket than we will gain pleasure from getting a new dollar. Once we understand that, then we can begin to craft messages, especially in our marketing, that target those impulses. Remember, we're not supposed to play fair, we're hypnotists. Okay? We are reality technicians. Regardless of, of you know, what your field of application is, but as that, most of you are primarily therapists, would that be true? Your job is not to get people to believe you. Your job is not to make people um, no, indirectly. I just kind of sound weird. Your job is not to make people feel good about themselves. Those are results of something much more, much more fundamental. Compliance. Nothing you want to achieve happens if the subject in the chair doesn't do what you tell them to do. And if you, to the, great, to the degree that you have compliance, you have success. Your job, ladies and gentlemen, is not to foster belief, not to, not to make people feel good and happy. Those are results of one thing. People following their instructions of doing what you tell them to do. To the degree that they do that, you can give them anything they want with a high probability that they're going to get it. But until you wrap your head around the fact that we're compliance professionals, 
You'll be successful. It's just a question of degree. Right? That's the one thing I've learned. It's a meta skill. To the degree that you get people to do what you tell them to do, you can help as many people and get anything you want. Make sense? So, are we clear on that? The Cartesian value question is what's important? You see, I forgot, didn't you? <laughs> yes? Well, it's hard to parse it as you were doing it, so I was wondering if you had I'm going to outline it for you. There's only one question you need to ask. You ready? What's important about? That's it. Then you echo whatever comes out of their head, out of their mouth. Right? That's all I did with this job. It's just showing up. Right? Matter of fact, uh, you guys want me to just lecture? You guys want to actually practice some of this stuff? Oh, you want that too? God, you guys want everything! All right, let me give you the form, the algorithm for Cartesian values real quick, then we'll do some state control work. Okay? Uh, people hate my YouTube videos, but people love my YouTube videos for some reason, but the one part they hate about it is all the questions. Because David goes off on tangents. Criterion values elicitation. Okay? Remember, these are the emotional building blocks of a person's identity. Okay? So when you start accessing criterion values, you're literally finding the most personal things to them in the, within the context you're operating and playing a little song. So the question is the criteria, the primary criteria question is what important about X, whatever X is, okay? So, who wants to play? Nobody wants to play. Okay, so let me ask you a question, sir. What's your name? Jeff. Jeff. What's important about learning conversational hypnosis to you personally? Better interaction with people in general and better Better interaction for people in general and better for your for people in your practice or your practice? The success of my practice. The success of your practice. Excellent. And if you were to be um, if it were better if you were to improve your practice or better what were the words you used again? I'm sorry. <laughs> the better interaction with people in better. So if you were to interact better with people, what would that do for your business? Hopefully bring you more clients. Hopefully bring you more clients. And if you were to have more clients. And again, I'm just doing this so I can understand you better because my job is to make sure that what I have to offer is a fit for you. And the only way I can do that is to make sure I understand your world and what you want and need so I can give it to you. Does that make sense? So how would this help your practice? Better success with clients and better referral basis. Excellent. If you had better success with clients and a better referral basis. Ultimately, what would that do for you? What would that give you in your life? More power. And More power. Freedom of time. And freedom of time. So ultimately, it's all about freedom and time and power, isn't it? And if we can, if I can give you that, if I can show you how these skills will actually systematically bring you a more powerful way of communicating, not just in with your clients, but in every aspect of your life, then you'll get more clients, you'll be more successful, and ultimately, every aspect of your life will change in the ways you want. Good. How are you feeling right now, brother? Right? All I did was elicit a hierarchy of criteria, things, that words that came out of his mouth. And I kept going until I got something that I knew was really where he wanted to go. Could you see or, ex or could you sense when his emotion changed? When he hit power and control in his life? There was a visible shift in him. And guess what? That's why you're all here. You just have different words for it. Okay? And so the point is, is this whole class is about power and control. It's about learning how to take the randomness out of our life so we can be more successful in our practice. So we can get the freedom and time that we want. Because in the end, that's the most important currency that we have, isn't it? That time and that freedom. And that's exactly what this course does. Yes, sir. 
wasn't it uh, this is the emotional building blocks of identity, the mm -hmm. C and B, and something at a buck about a person, something a second. When you start working on a criterion values level, you, you're bypassing the critical factor deeply. You're 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 stimulating emotional responses. Remember what we begin this travelers talk with. When you have an emotional shift, all of your perceptual filters change. So that you only pay attention to the elements of the communication that reinforce or re-trigger the state you're in. Now, if I'm, if I'm going for emotions in the first place, remember, what I was describing to you was when, as in random communication. What do you think happens when we start targeting that? When we start stimulating emotional responses on multiple levels simultaneously, it's unstoppable. You can't, you just can't resist it. Okay? You, I'm getting you with so many rights, you're begging for a left. <laughs> right? So, that leads us in, but the, the important thing to remember is there's two ways to, that you can apply criteria and values formula. You can do a hierarchy, this being the most superficial, the first thing that comes out of the mouth, and you say, well, what's important about X? What's important about Y? And then what's important about what they just gave you? And then what's important about that? And as you get closer and closer to the deep level criteria, the highest level criteria, you will see their emotional response is deepen and strengthen. Right? But you have to validate that. This can't be a linguistic trick that you're trying to pull on somebody. For most of you especially, unless you've mastered the state control rules, which we're still going to do. You have to be sincere in your desire to get them what they want. And if what they're describing to you, you can't provide, you have a fiduciary responsibility to send them somewhere else. Okay? This is not about tricking people. That's the difference between me and all the other evil Jedi. Okay? We move through the world making everyone around us feel ridiculously good by showing them how to get everything they want by giving us what we want. Does that make sense? Okay? Yes? You said this in the first hour, but I think it's really important to connect back to again, is that deeper criteria piece is what's been with a lot of people is they know their values, but they don't know how to know when they have their values. It's very true. You, you did a really good job in the first thank hour you. explaining that to start. Well, thank you. And, it's, and, and he hit a nail on the head. you got to know. Most relationships, I, I, I started on the infamous side of things, get teaching people how to have better orgasms. And the first thing I taught, my first course I ever put out was a book called Secret Orgasm Tips. And the first, the first two three chapters was all on the checklist that every woman has that they know that, that constitutes the ideal lover in their world. Every woman on the planet is carrying, she, she knows, she's right there, right? I know this, I've been here, I've been here a hundred times. The bottom line is every woman on the planet, guys, you're doing the same thing, we're just very simple. <laughs> Seriously. Oh, go to my YouTube channel. You can watch my Flirt Factor videos, watch my speed attraction videos. I, I, I bag on those guys because we're done as rocks. Yeah. Seriously, a woman can walk a woman can walk up to a guy and go and he'll sit there and go, I wonder what she meant by that. <laughs> I kid you not. But here's the thing you didn't understand is the checklist from a psychology perspective is called projection. The maps we carry around inside of us, we project onto everyone around us and we're always looking for matches or mismatches. If we find someone that matches, we feel connected to them. We have a chemistry with them. If it doesn't match, they're wrong. Right? And every one of you is moving through the world projecting that list onto everyone around you. The corollary to that is in a dating or romantic context. When a woman kisses you, she will kiss you in the way she wants to be kissed. She will touch you where she wants to be touched. In the order and sequence, she wants you to touch her. Why? Because she's following a map. She's following a checklist that constitutes what, what's the perfect touch, the perfect kiss, the perfect timing. And she's following that pattern. She's telling you 
everything you need to know to give her exactly what she wants. All you have to do is pay attention. Okay. Apparently I have five minutes, so I have to speak very, very quickly. <laughs> I, I, I love this. Can you tell I love what I do? Yeah. I love you guys. I mean, like I said, this is the most fun I have without my clothes on. Or with my clothes on. <laughs> oh, Freud didn't slip there. You know. But there's, a, there's an overall pattern I want you to see. Whether we're talking about romance, sexuality, we're talking about persuasion and influence, criteria and values, autonomizing, the words that come out of the subject are the most powerful trans-inducing words there are. And when you give them back, you gain an unspeakable, no pun intended, level of power in their world. Keep them connected to their criteria and values, and they will do what you ask out of default. If there's something, if there are persons in your office who's there for a reason other than their own, parse that out, give them back their autonomy, find their reason for wanting to do what they came to do. Link it to the criteria and values. Use your cause and effect and complex equivalents to connect it all. To tell them, to illustrate and describe to them what that will mean for them using their words. And they will, you will create a powerful Powerful relationship with people. Stay in control. Everybody stand up. You thought I was going to forget. Yeah. All right. First things first. Get that TED Talk by uh, Amy Cuddy on power postures. It's worth its weight in gold. There's two ways that we can control our state. The one way is called through willpower. That's the way we all try to do things, and it fails miserably. Okay? Because your willpower is a finite resource. It's based on two things. The amount of sleep that you get and the amount of blood sugar in your system. Okay? Get a book by Roy Baumeister called Willpower. It explains it all. We burn willpower units every time we have to exert control over our emotions. So the more stressful a day you have, the more willpower you lose. That's why... Roy Baumeister, B-A-U-M-E-I-S-T-E-R. Now, there's another way to control your state, a much more powerful, universal way. Most of you won't do it. But if you understand what I'm going to give you now, you can walk into a, a battle, a war zone, and be relatively calm. If you practice. Okay? So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to think of a time in your life when you learn something powerful. Learn something fast, and you use it and you succeeded magnificently. Okay? I want you to see what you saw, hear what you heard, feel what you felt. Okay? Stand the way you were standing. Breathe the way you were breathing. Bring that posture back. Man. Total victory. You saw something you wanted, you put a plan into action, you went for it. Bring those feelings back. Notice where in your body you feel it. Stand that way. As you stand that way, holding that posture, holding that physiology, without changing anything, Try to feel bad. <laughs> Notice you can't do it. Now watch. Turn around and look at the far wall. I don't want you to look at me when you do this shit. <laughs> now I want you to think of a time when you were disappointed. You went for something it didn't work out. I want you to stand the way you were standing. Breathe the way you were breathing. Feel the way you were feeling. Let those feelings come back. Notice how your posture shifts and changes. Go into that posture. Now, while holding that posture, while holding that mindset, try to feel good. Notice you can't quite do it. Now, here's what I want you to do. While holding on to this less than positive emotion, shift your body back to the positive physiology. Back to that winner's physiology, that rapid learning physiology. Notice what happens to your feelings. Now double that feeling. Because I know what you did. <laughs> I turn around and look up here. What'd you notice? 
Exhilarating. Exhilarating? When I had you hold the less than positive posture, and I had you try to feel good, what happened? Couldn't do it. When I asked you to hold on to the less than positive emotion and shift your body back, what happened? Your, your, your feelings changed, didn't they? Your physiology controls everything. Your willpower can... Have a seat. Your willpower is a finite resource. It's based on the amount of sleep you have, whatever filters you've got going on inside, which are emotional based, but the amount of glucose in your system. Your willpower can be overridden. The more neurological arousal you have, the faster your critical factor checks out. Okay? We are emotionally creatures. We have to finish now. So I have some, some paperwork for things like that, um, for trainings. How many want to take this further? Okay. Cool. See me after class. I'll hand out some special paperwork. I have some special stuff only for HypnoThoughts people. Um, get that, that video by Amy Cuddy. Holding postures like this, these victory postures you see people automatically go into when they win, hold them for as little as two minutes, your testosterone rises by 25%. Testosterone is the achievement hormone. Whether you're male or female, it's the confidence hormone. You're going into a situation, a session, public speaking, find a stall in the bathroom, <laughs> I do. Okay? Here's the weird part. I'm going to run a little bit over. I guess people need to get in here. But 5,000 years of Chinese medicine, one of the most powerful Qigong exercises was an exercise called standing on stake. It's a secret, it's a secret posture for generating massive strength and power and qi. And if people would stand for hours like this, Hmm. Two minutes, 25% increase in testosterone. Six hours. <laughs> Hope you had a good time. Thank you. Yeah.